going to all over the United States and Canada uh, to teach this work. In other words, all of the work we've done here this week and that we will do here this week, as you can see, is given only to about 100 or 125, 150 people. And there isn't a reason in the world why that same work can't be given to 5,000. There must be that many in the world interested in the message. So by recording it on tape, our teachers in all of the cities in the United States and Canada will have uh, one period of week in which they'll have canned goldsmith for their uh, menus. They'll have one of these hour tapes, and once a week they'll have a, an hour lecture or uh, class, so that the chances are in uh, November, Hawaii and Canada, Victoria, Vancouver and Calgary, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Detroit, Chicago, oh, several other cities, will be listening to the work we did here. And they'll be listening to it in my voice on this tape. And uh, that just about increases our audiences 20-fold. And instead of just 100 people or 150 people hearing a class, we'll have, oh, easily 1,500 or 2,000 hearing it every single week. In the same way that when I'm gone, you will have the machine here and you will be able to have my Seattle work, Portland work, the work I did in Honolulu, the work I did in Vancouver, the work the last Hollywood classes on tape, closed class. And so you will be able to have here one hour every week, or as much more as you want, of lectures and classwork that I have given in other cities. And the same thing, if uh, Seattle and Honolulu and Vancouver was interested enough to come and hear it, as you have been, the chances are there'll be something in that hour that'll be worth your while hearing. And in that way, it's really, as the way I see it, a wonderful way of presenting the message and presenting it straight from headquarters and uh, keeping our vision on what the principle is. You know, the greatest difficulty that you are going to have, because it's the greatest difficulty I have had, and it's still a difficulty once in a while, because I don't know if we ever get to a place where we completely outgrow these difficulties. The main difficulty is going to be on keeping the vision on one point, keeping the vision on the principle itself. First of all, we've studied so many different kinds of metaphysics that we have a dozen different systems in our system. And we continuously use the language of uh, that which we've known and which we have outgrown. And it's difficult to overcome that. I had a letter in the mail this morning from a lady in the Middle West who writes me that she has been for many years a Christian scientist. She has a problem and it isn't yielding. She wants help. And she says, I have been declaring every day that I am perfect and I am spiritual and I am this and I am that and I am the other thing. Well, of course, I wrote her, if you're spiritual and perfect, what do you want help for? Seems kind of foolish to be so perfect and spiritual and harmonious and seeking help too. Now. Every time we make the statement, I am spiritual, I am perfect, I am harmonious, it would seem to me that we're insulting our own intelligence. It's true that it was a step in our metaphysical development. There was a time when, because of uh, orthodox religious teachings, that we probably thought we were a worm in the dust, not fit to come near the hem of the robe. It may have been also through our teachings not only church teachings, but medical teachings, that we were thought we were human beings or that we were mortals. 
and or that we were sinners. And of course it was right that in coming into truth teaching, any of the truth teachings, we should learn something about our true identity. Of course in our true identity we are children of God, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ and God, and we're even a little closer than that. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. And uh, probably in studying truth and in learning truth it may have been necessary to repeat those statements as affirmations to remind ourselves that they really were true. Perhaps it was necessary to remind ourselves that instead of what we appeared to be, actually we were spiritual or are spiritual and perfect and harmonious. But that led that sort of teaching, which was correct in its absolute sense, led to a misconception of truth. And on that misconception, much of the metaphysical work of the world has been wrecked. Whatever failure there is in metaphysical demonstration, outside of that which came through the wrong type of person getting into the work, I mean by that, in the early days of metaphysics, it was a very profitable activity to engage in. It was a well-paid profession, and it attracted people who were not called of the spirit to the work, who saw that it was a wonderful opportunity to make a very good living without too much hard work. And the result was that the metaphysical world became pretty well populated with uh, people who weren't spiritually on the level. They may have been humanly very good, but spiritually they weren't on their base. They weren't equipped for that work. And then it attracted another type of person, and that is the very honest and well-meaning person, the very good human who is all a flutter to serve humanity and do good for the brotherhood, but who haven't the spiritual equipment. And between those two types of thought, metaphysics got an awful jolt. And instead of a couple of thousand truth centers around the United States, it's been reduced to a couple of hundred just because of its own ineffectiveness. Now, those two re that reason of those two wrong types that got into the work, and that will always spoil it, remember, because spiritual work should be done by those who have a call of the spirit, not a call of man. It must be a call of the spirit, otherwise it cannot be properly conducted. But the biggest damage to the metaphysical world beside that one came from this teaching of I. I am spiritual. I am perfect. I am whole. I am harmonious. I am rich. When it wasn't true at all. The I that they were talking about was Joel, Mary, Bill, person a human being calling himself spiritual, a human being that was born and is going to die, a human being that is getting older every day, a human being walking around with eyeglasses and saying, I am spiritual, I am perfect, I am harmonious. Human beings walking around without the price of the rent in their pocket saying, I am rich and I know it. I have abundant wealth. You see, that's an insult even to human intelligence. <coughs> No wonder that some of our more educated and cultured people thought we were crackpots. We were, and we are, in the degree that we think that human beings are spiritual, or that human beings are divine, or that human beings are children of God. Why don't you know that if a human being was a, children of, a child of God, they'd never in the world have a lack or limitation or infirmity or sin or disease or death, a false appetite, a false desire. The children of God have no such things as that. The children of God have no lack of limitation. The children of God know no such thing as limitation in any form. As a matter of fact, children of God don't even have to study truth. No, children of God 
live and move and have their being in divine consciousness and spiritual consciousness and the secret place of the Most High. What we call human beings, mortals, is that state of consciousness which has come to accept the selfhood apart from that divinity, which accepts itself as somebody that has to earn its own living, take care of itself, so forth and so on. Now, for that false concept of self, that false image to walk around saying, I am spiritual, I am perfect, makes it an impossibility to demonstrate. And that's why you will find so little demonstration in that type of metaphysical work. I am this and I am that and I am the other thing. I am none of those things as a human being. I am none of those things as a person who was born and must look forward to dying. Now then, even though it was a step in the right direction, it's a step that has to be outgrown. And it's a step that we are having difficulty with. Getting rid of the old language and the old habits of thought or cliches, metaphysical cliches that we voice, although we have no inner sense of their real meaning, and we have to make a change. And one of the first changes that was made in the infinite way in this sense of treatment was along that line. Instead of this I am business, we changed our treatment to God is. God is immortal. God is eternal. God is immortality itself. God is omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence. God is infinite eternal life and God is the life of individual being. God is the soul and the mind of individual you and me. God is the substance of our being. God is all that. Do you see the difference between I, I am that and God is that? Now then, as we get to the realization of the infinite nature of God, and all this time, remember, we've forgotten ourselves. We've left ourselves out of the picture. We've left our humanhood out. We've left our mortality out. We have dwelt entirely on what God is, Ultimately, we come to the realization there is no me. That is, there is no such me as I see in a mirror. There is no such me as I thought I have been. There is no me that even has to say, I am this, that, or the other thing. The only me there is, is God manifested, God expressed. God expressing its own infinite individuality. God expressing the infinite nature of its own being as me. Now, you see, we're talking about the same me that Isaiah spoke of when he said, there are no gods beside me. No God beside me. No, I am he. And Jesus could say, thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. He was talking about that me, too. But he wasn't talking about the me that walks around saying, I am spiritual, I am rich, and I know it. Now, once we change this pattern of thought from trying to take a false concept and spiritualize it, it's as if we looked at the snake in the rope and said, you are spiritual. It isn't spiritual at all. The rope is. That is, the snake is not in the rope. The rope is rope. But suppose we looked at that and said, the snake is rope. That would be the equivalent of looking at a human being and saying, you are spiritual. Supposing we looked at tracks coming together and said, you are perfect. What, you tracks coming together are perfect? No. We'd have to look up and beyond that and say, tracks are perfect. Not you, because the you is this that we're looking at, and that's not perfect at all, and that's not perfection in tracks. Or supposing we saw the 
white poodle up on the stage. Are you all familiar with that illustration? Hello, how are you there? Welcome. Are we all familiar with that illustration? Oh, sure you are. Yeah. I know you are. Um, in uh, presenting the message of the infinite way and explaining this nature of error that we are facing each day, I use the illustration that came to me years ago in my practice and trying to explain that thing to someone, that supposing we were at a vaudeville show and we had a hypnotist on the stage and he invited someone up from the audience and hypnotized them and then said to them, uh, chase that white poodle off the stage, get rid of him, get him backstage. And of course the hypnotized person would immediately start to chase that white poodle off the stage because being hypnotized he would see what the hypnotist wanted him to see and that would be a white poodle. Now I said this, supposing that this hyp hypnotized person had difficulty in getting that white poodle off the stage and looked up and probably saw a metaphysical friend or practitioner and would say, oh you can help me, give me a treatment to get rid of my white poodle up here. Now you see, the practitioner or the metaphysician out there isn't seeing a white poodle because he's not hypnotized. He's seeing a blank stage. So the only treatment the practitioner or metaphysician could give would be to say, wake up. Come out of that hypnotized dream. And then you'll see there is no white poodle. Now then, Supposing the practitioner would have said, look at the white poodle and say, you are spiritual, you are perfect. Well, that's what happens every time we look at a human being and say, you are perfect, or you are spiritual, or you are the child of God. We're looking at a non-existent illusion and trying to make a child of God out of it, and you can't do it. The child of God needs no treatment and the child of God needs no affirmation. There's nothing wrong with the child of God. And you, at the center of your being, are that child of God. But when you say, I am the child of God, you're usually thinking of that thing called Joel, Mary, Bill. Never look at an error and say, you are spiritual. Never look at a cat or a dog and say you're a spiritual idea. Why, well, if they were spiritual ideas, they'd be so wonderful and perfect and immortal and eternal that you'd never have to say that about them any more than you have to walk around the street saying, I am honest. That would sound nice to your ears, wouldn't it, if you said you are honest? Or if somebody else came up to you and said you are honest, you'd be insulted. So of course I am. I don't need you to tell it to me either. But that's because you are aware of your integrity. You are not aware of the spiritual nature of your being. And saying that a human being is that isn't going to make it so. There's only one way to come into that awareness. And that is to realize that God is perfection, that God is the reality, and that this hypnotism, this suggestion from outside can't make you other than that which in reality you are. Now, this completely changed our mode of metaphysical practice and it completely changed our language since no more did we indulge in this you are spiritual business. Oh, how many years I watched that in the practice, people coming in saying, of course I know I'm spiritual. Well, what are you here for? What do you want? It was like someone used to say, oh, you know, I know that the body is just an illusion. Well, what do you want to get it healed for? Why don't you jump out the window and get rid of it? Get rid of it if you're sure it's an illusion and something you don't want. The body isn't an illusion at all. The body is a temple of God. What we believe about the body is an illusion. We have an illusory sense of the body, and we have to change that, but we don't have to change our bodies. If we ever wake up out of this hypnotism and see what our bodies really look like, we're going to fall in love with them. Because they're really beautiful. 
but they're a whole lot different than finite or hypnotized sense claims they are. And so only when you see yourself through spiritual vision can you see yourself as you are. Isn't it in Scripture? When we waken, we will see him as he is and we will be satisfied with this likeness. Indeed, that's true. When we awaken out of this mortal dream, not by death, but by spiritual regeneration, when we waken out of this mortal dream and see ourselves as we really are, we're going to be well satisfied with what we behold because we are the very manifestation of God's being. We are the very God being itself expressed but not as we appear to be and not as we think of ourselves and therefore we do away with this language of I am spiritual and you are spiritual and we translate it into God is life eternal. God is immortal being. God is the substance of all form. God manifests itself, its infinite nature and character as individual you and me, as individual idea, as individual being. God is the life of our being. God is the substance of our being. God is the law unto our being, the very principle of it. God is that which maintains and sustains our being, and therefore our being in its true nature is uh, perfect. And you watch the different result that will have when you stop trying to look at the white poodle and say you are spiritual. Stop looking at the snake in the rope and saying you are rope. You can't do it. You never will make an illusion reality. But if you will look away from the illusion, away from the human person, the human body, the human mortality, and keep your mind stayed on God, you will witness God appearing as your individual life and body. Then you'll see this whole spiritual picture as it is. When Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, when he said, I am the resurrection, you know he wasn't saying Jesus is. He very definitely said of Jesus, I can of my own self do nothing. If I speak of myself, I bear witness to a lie. My doctrine is not mine. That's what he was said about Jesus. So when he was talking about, I am the way, the truth, and life, I am the resurrection, thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, it was only because he had, through meditation, through realization, come to the center of his own being where he found himself to be God, where he found God to be himself, where he found God to be the real nature of his being, and from that standpoint he could say, I. Now it's in the same way as we come back, and today we're going right up there into uh, the very depths of this infinite way work. Now close your eyes and realize that deep within your own being there is something called I. To yourself just say the word I. That I is actually God and it manifests itself as the Son of God or individual you. You see, Father and Son and Holy Ghost are one. Father and Son and Holy Ghost are one. I and the Father are one. But that invisible I that you have just declared is the father of you. It is the creative principle of you. It is the law under your being. And you are the son of it. 
You are its creation, its child, its manifestation. But you're one, you're not two. You can understand that, that your father is both father and husband, but he's still only one. And so you are both father and child. That infinite, invisible thing we call I. Not that boisterous I that is an egotist. I can do this and I can do that and I can do the other. We're not talking about that I now. We're talking about this sweet, gentle I at the center of your being. This very gentle presence that is saying to you, listen to it. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Now, there's nothing egotistical about that, is there? There's nothing boisterous, there's nothing boastful about that. That's a sweet, gentle presence saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And it says, Lo, I am with you unto the end of the world. There's power in that, but there's gentleness and there's humility. That's not this braggart out here boasting, saying I'm well and I'm rich and I'm all the rest of these things. This is gentleness itself saying to you, fear not. I am ever with you. All that I have is thine. I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. If you walk through the waters, you will not drown. I will be with you. If you walk through the fire, the flames will not kindle upon you. I will be with thee. Though wars come, yet I shall not fear. I will be with thee. Now that I, way down there in the deep of your being, that I will never leave you, and it is uh, the father of you. And your realization of this truth as we are doing it now in this quietness and silence is called the Holy Ghost or communion. You are now communing with your father, I, God, at the center of your being. And therefore I, God, and I, Joel, am one. And this communion between the two is the Holy Ghost. It is the divine communion. Someday, if you ever receive illumination, it will come to you in the form of the mystical wedding or union. And you will witness yourself being married to Christ. And that mystical marriage is only a conscious realization of the oneness that exists between God and myself. The indissoluble union that took place in the beginning. Now this is communion. A communion with the Father within. And it is a recognition and a realization that this gentle eye at the center of your being is your God, your Creator. It is the power and the presence that maintains you and sustains you unto eternity. You need never look outside to a person, a place, a thing, or a condition. If you will learn to commune this way every day of your life, make this contact this communion with the I that I am and realize why son all that I have is thine let this father within you say to you son all that I have is thine you need not labor nor struggle nor strive you need not sweat nor bleed nor cry all that I have is thine. Only look to me for it. Don't look to the world for it. Don't look to husband or wife or parent or child. Look to me. And if you have a court case, don't even look to the judge 
for justice or the jury. I am the judge and I am the jury. I am the law and I am the lawgiver and I am the enforcer of the law. Look to me. Look to me. Look within. Make your daily contact with me. Never, never live your life as though you were separate and apart from me. I, I am your father in the midst of you. I gave you this identity. I brought you into this world. I sent you into this world. It wasn't your human mother or father. They were just the avenues through which I operated. That seed that's supposed to have been your beginning, how do you think it got there? There must have been an eye, a presence, or a power even to form that seed. Don't think the seed is the beginning of you. There was something that formed the seed, and I am that which formed the seed. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. Whatever trouble you have been in is only because you've looked for help every other place on the globe except to this father of yours within your own being. When you say, I am spiritual, I am perfect, you're lying. Only I am spirit. Only I at the center of your being am immortal. And I give that immortality to you. I vest you with dominion over the earth but it's my dominion that you are expressing. You can't say, I have dominion. You must say, I have dominion. I, at the center of me, has dominion. And that dominion is expressed through me, Joel, Mary, John. But it's God's dominion. And in the same way, you must learn to say, I have no life to live, to die, to be born, only I have life. I am in the midst of you, but that life which I am is your life, and so you are immortal. Ah, God is immortal, and the immortality of God is my immortality. Never again let me say I am immortal. I am spiritual. God is immortal. God is spiritual. And the immortality and the spirituality of God is made manifest as the harmony and perfection of my being. Not I am wealthy, but rather the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. God is wealthy. But that God at the center of me says, Son, all that I have is thine. Look to me for it. Let me pour it through. Relax, relax, rest. I am with thee. I will never leave thee. I will never forsake thee. Standing at the Red Sea, Moses did not make it open. But the father of the Hebrews, that which was guiding them, spoke through Moses and said, Open, and the Red Sea opened. Moses did not bring manna from the sky, but this divine power within him that was leading the Hebrews out of their slavery, that divine power sent manna unto those Hebrews. Now whatever it is that you call God, whatever it is that sent you into manifestation, that will supply you with manna, if necessary, from the sky, with water, if necessary, from the rock, with the wine of inspiration. If you can't get it from a teacher or a book, it'll unfold within your own being. Right where you are, God is, and where God is, you are, for we are one. Just one. And the I that I am is God. God at the center of my being, pouring itself forth into expression bountifully. Bountifully, God pours itself into expression. See how different that is than saying, I am rich, I am wealthy. 
<coughs> God pours its bounties through me, to me, as me. God in the midst of me is mighty. God is a fortress. God is a rock. Read your psalms again and get the new meaning of the psalms. Get this higher meaning that when we speak of God as a fortress and God as a rock, it means that this very gentle I at the center of your being is a rock on which you can stand and look out at the world and say, Thou couldn't have no power over me unless it came from the Father within. But don't look out at the world at a lot of white poodles and snakes in the rope and call them spiritual because they're not. They're illusions. They're nothingness. One day, you're going to wake up with a tremendous shock. You'll understand what it meant in Scripture when it said they crucified Jesus because he made himself equal with God and thought it not unseemly to do the works of God. You're going to be shocked one day when you wake up and find that the infinity of God, the infinite nature of God, the infinite wisdom and intelligence of God, the infinite life and power of God is really the infinite nature of your own individual being. The infinity of God is the in infinite nature of your individual being. You are as infinite as God. You can do the works of God, only not when you say it in this way, you are infinite or I am infinite, but only when you say God is infinite and is pouring that infinity into expression as my individual being. Then you will be as infinite as God, as eternal as God, as immortal as God, but you won't say it in that way. You'll say God is immortal as my being. God is infinite as my being. The infinity of God, the infinite, eternal nature of God is made manifest as me. And there you'll find your true humility, not sanctimony even, but a true humility that knows the infinite nature of your own being because you know its source to be God. No boasting, I am spiritual, I am perfect, I am healthy, I am wealthy. None of that. Because now, and from henceforth on, when you use the word I, use it gently, use it softly. You're talking about God. You're not talking about man. You're talking about God. And when you think of I, think of it as the source of infinite good. Think of it as that part of Jesus that could feed 4,000, 5,000, 7,000, and women and children too. Think of it as that part of your practitioner and your teacher that can heal multitudes. Heal multitudes. You can't do it, and I can't do it. But I can. Oh, yes, I, in the midst of you, am mighty. I can. That I at the center of your being. And each day I ask you this. You who study the infinite way, each day commune with your Father. In the communion, you will find your completeness, your wholeness, your perfection, and never again will you voice it. But that which is whispered to you in the silence will be shouted from the housetops in demonstration. You will never again have to say, I am happy, or I am joyous, or I am prosperous. It'll shine in your face. It'll show forth in the clothing you wear. It'll show forth in the life and the smile of your face, of your body. The very activity and agility of your body will show forth how vital and alive you are, and you'll find yourself to be ashamed ever to say, I am alive, or I am vital, or I am well. You will let the heavens declare the glory of God. You will let the earth show forth his handiwork. You will let your body testify 
to what you in silence and in secrecy have learned. I, in the midst of thee, am mighty. And now listen to this. That I, at the center of your being, is your fortress. In case of war, famine, depression, drought, volcano, whirlwind, that I, at the center of your being, is your fortress. You won't have to run and look for a cellar to get into or a bomb shelter. Stand still wherever you are and realize the word I. I am a fortress and a shelter. I am a tent over you. I am a sanctuary in which you can hide. The I at the center of your being is the sanctuary in which you can hide, and that's why Jesus could say you must worship there. No more shall ye worship in this holy mountain, nor yet in that beautiful temple in Jerusalem. No more. We don't need the outer symbols anymore. Now you worship in the temple of your own being, and in the same way, we can tell you in the infinite way, you don't need bomb shelters anymore. You don't need physical fortresses anymore. The day is past for those. All you need to do is retire quietly, peacefully, gently into the humility of this realization. I, I in the midst of you am mighty. I am the fortress. You remember, I told you, in the last war, how they sent out Bibles with steel plates in them for the soldiers to protect themselves with. Does anyone need steel plates in the Word of God? Is the steel plate the protection? Is the physical book the protection? Or is the Word of God the protection? Why, it's the Word of God that's the protection, and all orthodoxy missed the point. They thought that a book, worn old, put in the pocket over the heart, was the protection. And not only that, but then they put steel plates in it. The Word of God is enough in and of itself to be your sanctuary and your protection. Just as the Word of God itself is your medicine. You don't need the Word of God and a bottle of medicine. You don't need the Word of God and pills. The Word of God in itself is the medicine. Well, if the Word of God itself is the medicine or the surgeon's knife, then the Word of God itself is the fortress, the sanctuary, the temple, the church. And eventually we're going to learn that the Word itself is our body. The Word becomes flesh and dwells among us. But don't you see, it isn't repeating this with the mind that demonstrates it for us. It isn't the affirmation or the denial of it. It is the retirement into this quiet period and the communion with the I that I am with God. After that, let the bullets fly. Let the germs fly. Let all the beliefs of the world go by and the 94th Psalm will be demonstrated. It will not come nigh the dwelling place of those who live in the secret place of the Most High. And the secret place of the Most High is the Word of God, the Word of Truth. That's our sanctuary. And from henceforth on, our reliance, remember, is in the infinite invisible, not in anything that's visible or tangible to the human sense. And you know, this is a clear presentation of my understanding of the infinite way. The infinite way is the way of a reliance on the infinite, not on anything finite, no matter how strong it may be. Not a bank vault, and not a bank itself, but the infinite way is the way of dependence on the infinite. But nobody has ever seen, heard, tasted, touched, or smelled the infinite, and our reliance is on the infinite word as we learn to commune with it. If you will never permit a day of the week to go by without some period of this quiet, peaceful communion, 
you will find that instead of spiritualizing a human mortal concept, you'll be uh, obeying Paul. You'll be letting it die daily. And then you'll be reborn of the spirit. And uh, when you awaken from that birth, you really and truly say, I'm satisfied with that likeness. Thank you.